Well, if you guys would, the gospel lesson today is from the gospel according to John, the 14th chapter. It's very familiar words, and I'm going to say a couple of times and repeat a couple of sentences. And these are words from Jesus. Hi, Mom. How are you? Those two are awesome. What are their names? Um, Owen and Jack. Owen and Jack. Can everybody clap for Owen and Jack? Because they were awesome. Cool. I think Jack liked that. Yeah, all right. There's preacher material for you right there. Look out, okay? <laughs> These words from Jesus come towards the end of his ministry, and they are a promise and a real huge, huge clue as to what it means to follow Jesus in this world. And this is the second of a three-part series on Jesus saying, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. How are we doing? Are we going to have enough chocolate milk for everybody, Sarah? All right. We're getting really close. And man, that last little bit of chocolate milk. Oh, oh, oh. oh there's a little sugar in there. It's going to be great. Cool. Sarah Bain, by the way, let me just tread water here for a second. Sarah Bain is a student at Luther Northwestern Seminary. Um, are you a first year student there, Sarah? Yep. And she um, is a graduate of Luther College in Decorah, Iowa. And she worked for the St. Paul Chamber Orchestra for a number of years after her graduation from Luther, um, basically helping them raise funds for the chamber orchestra, a really wonderful job. And Sarah has come to us as an intern for the next, um, for 18 months um, to help with our confirmation program. And she is uber talented and um, fabulous. Could you, with your applause, say thank you to Sarah? We're good. Okay. Gospel of John, 14th chapter, words of Jesus. They go like this. The first sentence is extremely important, but it's not the sermon for today, but I want to read it twice. Jesus said this, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Oftentimes, angels in the New Testament, when they encounter people, start off with, Do not be afraid. The risen Jesus, first words, Do not be afraid. I think all of us could learn to embody this particular phrase well. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God and also believe in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And when I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. I don't want to lose that in the midst of this longer story here. So I want to read it again. I am preparing a place for you and I will come again and I will take you to myself so that where I am, there you may be also. Beautiful promise. Jesus continued and said, and you know the way to the place where I'm going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? And Jesus answered him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. If you know me, you will know my Father also. From now on, you do know him, and you have seen him. The gospel this day. Last week, we talked about Jesus' claim as being the way, and we talked about what this life means when Jesus reaches his hand out to us and says, come and follow me. Come and take this walk with me. Come and spend your sacred life with me. And today, I want to talk a little bit about what it means when Jesus says, I am the truth. Um, there's an acronym that I want you to remember from today. The acronym is WEIRD, okay? Um, Western, Industrial, Educated, Rich, Democratic. Okay? It um, offers us the lens by which we see most everything. It's a culture that we have been brought up in. But it is a unique culture. And it's not the same culture that Jesus grew up in. It's not a culture shared universally across time and through, through um, generations of people. It's a unique perspective. And one of the ways in which we exhibit our weirdness is that we have boiled faith down to a bunch of propositions, a bunch of truth claims that you need to kind of sign off on if you're going to be one of us. If not, you will always be one of them, and we will affix certain labels to you, like the word lost, that is really unfortunate. Okay? And we have had these little wars between ourselves for centuries. Okay? We see them now. The beauty of denominationalism, of these different kinds of Christian faiths, these different faith traditions, is that each one of them has something unique to offer the understanding that we have about God in this world 
and the person of Jesus, at the heart of each denomination beats an insight and a perspective that is both helpful and rich and wonderful. But to its kind of dark side, denominationalism becomes a turf battle of truth claims. And it becomes this us and them, and there is a fight. And some of us are refugees from such fights. Okay? Jesus says this is not propositional. And in fact, Jesus got in trouble in his own day and age because there were similar turf wars going on there. We miss the nuances of them with our kind of um, contemporary ears because we don't know the difference between a Pharisee and a Sadducee, for instance. And we don't know all the particular histories of all the different sects of Judaism that existed in Jesus' day, but believe me, they did. And part of the reason that he was so unacceptable is he refused to play the game. He refused to buy into the propositions or to have to choose between this camp and that camp. And instead, he said, truth about God in this world is not a bunch of propositions. Truth in this world is a person, and this, the truth in this world is me. And you and I, once in a while, have to take off our weirdness and our comfort and familiarity with boiling everything down to a bunch of truth statements and instead look firmly at the person of Jesus as truth. And that's where I want to kind of take us today. You see, the, um, the essential truth and the heart of Christianity is not a cause, but it's a person. It's not a particular agenda. It's a relationship. It's not a program. It's not a bunch of rites or rituals or theological camps or theological perspectives. Instead, finally, the truth of our faith is a person, and it's the person of Jesus. And to be Christian is really simple. Do you have a relationship with Jesus? Think about all the little dusty little towns and backwaters that Jesus entered into. And think about his initial encounters in each one of those places was always with a person that somehow had some brokenness, had been forgotten or mistreated. And Jesus went to them and didn't offer them a test or a quiz or a fill-in-the-blank essay. Jesus offered them him, his love, his embrace, his acceptance, his welcome into the kingdom of God. Period. Come follow me. Come walk with me. I am both the way and the truth. Okay. Um, I grew up in a time in the 70s where some of my more evangelical friends became familiar with using the phrase, have you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? And it always makes my teeth grind just a little bit. Because sometimes that's used with such an edge, and it's frankly used as a proposition. But at its heart, there's a truth there. Soren Kierkegaard said that at the heart of every believer is someone who's fallen in love. And I think that's true. Jesus doesn't win, wish to win us over with a debate. He wishes to overpower us. No, that's the wrong word. He wishes to win us over with love. And are you in love with Jesus? Have you returned the love? Have you accepted the love? Do you have a relationship with Jesus is really the central question. So, the essential element of Christian truth is that the risen Christ is not something that you mimic. It's not a rule book. It's not a manual. It's not the eight essential things for Christians to know and to do. Instead, finally, the essence of Christianity is that you do not mimic Jesus, but you manifest Jesus. Now, I, I taught this in confirmation this week, 7th and 8th graders, and Sarah did a beautiful job of illustrating what manifest is. Okay? We are simply to be Jesus and allow Jesus to live in us and through us. You think about it, that's just not a very Western or weird concept, but it's the essence of Christianity. Does Jesus shine in you? 
Is Jesus in you? Have you allowed Jesus to live within you? We had a baptism a couple weeks ago of a little guy named Owen. He was between like six months and nine months. He was old enough to sit up straight. He looked at me for the entire time. He looked out at the congregation the entire time. He won everybody over. And he had a whole bunch of cousins. I mean, it was a Saturday night service. And by the way, you guys missed most of the fun because we do about 90% of our baptisms on Saturday night. We do two or three each month, okay? And they're beautiful. And he had all his cousins. It was chaotic. There was like this huge buzz where the family sat over there of, of children everywhere. It was one of those big families that they are all having kids at the same time. I had their cousins come up. They got to put their hands in the water and remember that they were baptized. They got to watch, you know, this close as their cousin and brother was baptized. And what I hope most for everybody that's here is they remember this is their story. This is your story. You were given the spirit of Jesus at your baptism. It, it desires to live in you. And you are to manifest that, bring it with you, to show Jesus' face to this world everywhere you go. The word Messiah eventually got translated into the Greek to the word Christ, which simply means the anointed one. Christians are the anointed ones of Jesus, the anointed ones of Christ. You and I have been anointed with him, and we are to have him dwell in us to manifest him everywhere. Now, when people in this world say no to Christians and no to Christianity, I think it's because they've met a bunch of propositions that they're not quite willing to swallow. Or they've met a whole lot of judgment, or they've met a whole lot of um, argumentation. No wonder they say no to that. When Christians show up like Jesus, it's a powerful experience. And I bet you there is at least somebody in your life that has manifested Jesus to you. It can be as brief of an encounter as with a stranger who does something so breathtakingly awesome and gracious, that when they walk away and when you reflect on it, you go, man, the Spirit of God was there. It can be as brief a time as a week away at a camp or on a mountain hike or on some sort of pilgrimage. It can be as long as a lifetime when you reflect back on your aunt or your uncle or your grandparent or your wife or your husband or your best friend or your child, and you realize there is a whole lifetime legacy there of manifesting the person of Jesus as they walked through this life with you and forgave you when necessary, were generous beyond measure, who loved you without condition. We know the kind of power that happens when someone actually manifests Jesus for us. And that's the only reason you and I are here. The first point is just through the presence of God's Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus, we are to manifest Jesus wherever we are. Then the second point I want to make today is just the fact that following Jesus isn't about having a roadmap or a GPS where everything is just kind of spelled out for us, okay? Instead, it's like God gives you a driver's license, everything you need to have, and then gives you permission to live your life fully manifesting Jesus in this world. Let me give you a couple of examples. You know, anybody who's ever learned how to dance by the numbers, you can tell, okay? But those people who just dance, you can tell, okay? One of my sons has a theory that when you, when you go to dance, you got to dance, okay? And that if you're too self-conscious about what everybody else is thinking about when you're dancing, you're really not dancing. But when you let loose, here, here is the, the real genius of his theory. When you let loose, if you're really bad but you're extremely enthusiastic about it, everyone gives you a pass. And if you happen to be really good, it's beautiful to watch. But when you try to dance all clenched up, nobody really wants to watch. And you wish you wouldn't have. My wife tells me a story about my, our son Andrew, our oldest son. When he was like 13 or 14 years old, before he even had his permit, we were up in Starbuck, Minnesota, out in the country at my, my in-law's farm his grandparents' farm, and we had a big, we have a big Chevy Avalanche that we've had for about 11 years now. It's got like 200,000 miles on it, big Detroit steel. And um, she took Andrew, uh, when he was 13 or 14, out in the truck one day for the first time and said, let's drive around the section roads. There's nobody out here. And frankly, if you run off the road, you can't hit anything. You just get out in the field, you know. So there he got behind the wheel, and he was a little tiny teen, you know. He could barely see over the wheel. And they, they took this big truck out, and off they went. And then she said, 
About a mile into our drive, somebody came out onto one of the section roads, and he had to be at least a half a mile away. Andrew promptly pulled the car off the side of the road, put it in park, turned off the ignition, and sat and waited okay, for the car to come by. I think a lot of us take our baptismal promise. The Spirit of God is in you. You're qualified already. So just get out and drive now. Just get out and drive. Take Jesus. He's promised to be with you. He'll give you what you need. Go out and love unconditionally. Be generous beyond measure. Go out and muck it up with everybody. Get out in the real world life and help. Drive. Dance. In the New Testament, Paul says, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice, and rejoice is translated exactly the same word as the word dance. Dance, and again I say dance. Okay? Second point is, take the Spirit of God and the truth of Jesus and just get out and live. Okay? Then the last thing I want to talk about a little bit is, Jesus adds on to this statement in another section, and he says, Deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow me. I have a little trouble with some of this statement. You know, in the first one, deny yourself. Man, for our generation, that one kind of just doesn't sit right. But I think I understand it this way. You see, what Jesus is really asking us to do is move ourselves off the center of the universe. To not let ourselves be the prime concern anymore. We should be more secure than that. We are a child of God. God knows us by name. God has made us with intention. God has said, you are the object of my love. There is nothing you can do that can break this relationship. So in essence, love yourself, but get over yourself. Put yourself just off the center for a while so that you have room in your field of vision to see the people you need to see, the hurt and the broken and the forgotten and the marginalized. Get your vision off yourself for now because I've taken care of all of that. You know how it is at night when you can't see clearly? and you're trying to find something, and the real secret to it is to look just away from it and let your peripheral vision pick it up because it's better at night. There's something about cones and rods, and I don't understand all of it, okay? But it's true. Similarly, I think that we really finally find ourselves when we take our vision off ourselves. Because when we start looking at everybody else and start noticing them, the real byproduct of that is that we find ourselves in the process our authentic, true, whole, wonderful, amazing self. Jesus says when you give yourself away, you find yourself. That's one meaning of this word, deny yourself and pick up your cross and follow me. Then I want to talk about the cross for just a minute. The first truth is that when we are Jesus' followers, when we are with him in mission out in this world, when he abides in us, when we want to manifest him, we will suffer for the sake of others. There are going to be seasons and days in our life where we will have to pick someone else up and carry them. And it will not be easy. And it will cost us. And we will put aside some of our hopes, some of our dreams, to carry someone else for a while. And out of love and out of sacrifice, something wonderful blossoms there when we give ourselves away so much for the sake of somebody else. And this is the way of Jesus, and we are better people when we carry someone for a while. The second aspect of this is that we sometimes have to carry the cross of our own sin and our own imperfection. And here I want to use the metaphor of scarring. Okay, we all have scars in us. It's once in a while when I look out on a Sunday morning, and I, and I know many of your stories, and I think, what's the one thing that unifies all of us? not a political point of view, not an economic kind of a point of view. It's that we all have been scarred and we have had the saving, uh, healing love of God bind us up. And so our scars, as regrettable as they might be, and I don't think God ever wants us to hurt so bad that we have to scar, but we do hurt so bad that we have to scar because of this life that we live. But those scars make us, for other people, real. A perfect person is unapproachable when you feel broken. It's the genius of AA. Someone who is so broken and willing to surrender needs to be able to look at someone else who knows exactly their position. And all AA meetings are, as far as I'm concerned and I can tell, is that people show each other their scars 
and by doing so, they give themselves hope. I healed. I have been healed. My dad went through open-heart surgery in 1970-something, 74, 75. He was one of the first ones. Slowly, over time, most of his male friends also had to go through uh, bypass surgery. And my dad would have them out for a cup of coffee just after they told him, I went and saw my doctor, and guess what? I have to go under the knife. That's what they would say. And he would take them out to lunch, and I know what my dad did. Somewhere during that lunch, he started unbuttoning his shirt. And he showed him there's his scar and that it had healed. He said, it's not so bad. Our scars are good because they make us approachable and actually helpful to someone else if we're willing to show them. And the second person that it helps is us. It's good to see those scars and realize that God has indeed healed us and that when we break again, God will heal us again. Okay? Our scars remind us of our deep need for God. This world will have its way with us once in a while. We're going to get beat up and broken and bruised, and it's okay to remember that God will step in and heal and bring us home. Okay? So, Jesus says, I am the truth. Oh, I'm going to tell you one story. I know I've gone long today. I apologize. But about the virtue of scars, it's a story from the Eastern Orthodox Church, a priest who had a woman that was driving him crazy in his congregation because she was on a quest to eliminate all of her vices and claim all of the Christian virtues. And year by year, she was making progress in her mind. There was um, the authority there, instead of a pope or a bishop, you might, he, he's called the Metropolitan, and he would come worship in this particular place every Easter. And every Easter, this woman would come and accost him and tell him of her progress. And finally, one Easter, the Metropolitan shows up. His name was Metropolitan Anthony. And she gets him in the greeter's line afterwards. And she comes up to him and says, Father, she says, I have all the virtues now, and I only have one vice left. And he leaned into her and he whispered in her ear, for God's sake, woman, hold on to that vice, okay? <laughs> Thank you for laughing at that, okay? May we take all of ourselves and follow Jesus as the way, and may we claim the truth that is the person of Jesus in our life. In Jesus' name, amen.